not when we're live. Okay, hi everyone. Welcome to this chat with Hannah. Um, for those of you that don't know Hannah, Hannah is a fantastic animal behaviorist. Um, she works with dogs primarily. Um, so she's an absolute dog behavior expert. And for those, again, those of you that don't know, recently Hannah organized and, and was very fundamental in organizing a dog bite event in parliament. Um, with the App Dog Committee. Now, the App Dog Committee is the all party parliamentary dog advisory welfare group. And you can probably see I have to go to my notes to <laughs> remember what that stands for. But it's a really, really important committee because it, it's obviously very involved in looking at many matters related to dog welfare. Um, so, it was a recent event that I actually went to myself as a guest, and Hannah was, as I say, very fundamental in organizing, um, called the Dog Bite Problem part one and this event looked at some of the facts in dog bites so I'm really really pleased to say obviously we've got Hannah here today just to have a bit of a chat about what came up in that meeting what some of the key themes and topics that were discussed um, and um, give you for those of you that couldn't make it a bit of an insight on kind of what went on and what the implications of that are as well mm. so hi Hannah thank you for coming Thank you for having me, Daniel. This was a genius idea. I know there were loads of people that really wanted to be there. Um, and just enough, just to start with, a loving apology for those of you that did want to be there but couldn't. And were like, why aren't you live streaming it? And the answer is that um, we, we're not allowed to anymore. That Parliament now is open um, and APPGs, um, so parliamentary groups that meet, uh, those, those rooms are not allowed to be streamed. So thank you so much, Daniel, um, because everybody can now get lots of the juice see facts and data that came up in that meeting via this wonderful medium so thanks brilliant yeah so I mean perhaps to start off do you want to just tell us a little bit about um kind of what what happened who was speaking what we were talking about and also what triggered this why do we need to be talking about dog bites suddenly mm, yeah sure sure okay yeah so you know 2022 has been a really tricky year actually statistically um and i have been working with mark abraham learning to be a campaigner actually for a little while there's lots of things in the world that i'd love to change um and you know daniel with a background in behavior i think if we've got the skills haven't we to come up with um ingenious ways of, of changing behavior and and when you see something as um as dark as you know dog attacks on people or actually deaths via dog bites uh, that's some, that's behavior that I want to, to change <laughs> or at least look at. Um, and I think many people do. So this year was a really difficult year. Uh, and nine people have sadly, tragically um, been killed by dogs in the UK. And that's a staggering number. In 2021, four people tragically lost their lives. And in 2020, two people um, were also killed by dogs. So that's too many people. I think we can all agree. Um, and we don't want to see that if that is a trend, and we'll get into that in a little bit, is that a trend? And if it is a trend, how can we stop that curve from getting any bigger? Um, I also had the privilege during lockdown of uh, talking with a one of our presenters, Dr. Jen, John Tullock, um, who is an amazing epidemiologist and vet um, and works at the University of Liverpool. And he produced a study that came out during during lockdown that said that actually dog bites have tripled in the last 20 years and they've tripled with a particular group of people that we didn't quite expect. And again, we can talk about that in a little bit more depth if you'd like. Um, and I found that to be shocking um, because actually dogs who are biting humans, the, the data that we we've got that statistic from is people who've been hospitalized by dog bites. So that's a bit scary, actually, and something that I think we all need to, to look at. And I remember in lockdown just saying, John, we're going to shout about this when COVID is over. Um, we need to look at this as a nation, um, no matter what level entry level you are, whether you're a dog owner, whether you are not a dog owner, maybe you live next to one, um, maybe you are work for a council, or you're a trainer, or you're an MP, uh, or you work in hospitals, everybody needs to pitch in to this conversation we believe so 
how do you do that? Uh, this is a massive issue, um, a multifactorial, it's like a really complex trauma cake, you might say like a trauma trifle with lots of layers. And so as I started to, to dig into this and talk to lots of different people who know much more about this than I do, people like Dr. Carrie Westgarth, who also presented um, and co-authored a book called Dog Bites, an amazing tomb of information. Um, you know, you start to really see that this is this is a hugely complex issue. Um, and one of our other speakers, uh, Dr. Andrea Jester, um, she presented the human story and, and I met her again a couple of years ago. She was working, she is working at Birmingham Women's and Children's Hospital and she showed me uh, some of the information that she was currently having to give out to victims of, of dog bites and she's a plastic surgeon she works with children uh, reconstructing you know faces and hands and she basically came to me and said hannah i need you to make this stop <laughs> too many children are getting you know lifelong injury um because of dog behavior and so how how do we fix this and so we had this amazing team um jordan shelley co-led the campaign with me and we organized this incredible uh, panel of speakers and i started it with a bit of a rallying speech um again we can talk a little bit more about so that's just a bit of an overview um we had lots of very intelligent doctors that were coming and bringing the facts because you can't look at the why unless you really understand what the what is so yeah and and that was what was fantastic as well you I know mean, we had people from kind of all different corners of the the industry and not just at the dog industry but um you know kind of the, the work people that work with dog bites in any way whether it's you know treating dog bites whether it's preventing dog bites um as a behaviorist whether it's looking into dog bites as a researcher um so it was you know fascinating to kind of see all those people come together and i think one theme that you've, you've hinted at a little bit there that really came up was it's not just down to the dog owners to get on top or the dog caregivers to get on top of the situation with dog bites is it there's there's so many kind of moving parts to that situation so many things that we need to think about um it's 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 almost hard to comprehend as sitting there as an audience member because i obviously attended as an audience member it's like whoa like there's so much to think about in, in terms of how we actually start tackling this issue and it's it's so multifaceted in that way so yeah i mean do you want to tell us a little bit about kind of what you spoke about perhaps to start off? Because I think your your talk, I mean, one of the big focuses was obviously keeping an open mind and also how we can all work together on that issue. So I think it really was really, really relevant to what then came later um, from from all the other experts that spoke. Sure. I think, um, you know, as as I was preparing for this meeting as you say daniel it's it is really complicated um and the thing to bear in mind is i think that everybody has different skills everybody i believe has a unique jigsaw piece uh, of skills that fits into the big jigsaw of life you know we 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 work together we fit together as a community um and really i started and, and opened with just a reminder that it's really easy in the dog world to for everyone to become quite isolated you know for people to sort of problem solve pain points on their own um we see it a lot you know many people produce the same sorts of products and especially in the dog training world and rescue um we tend to really we're passionate about seeing pain stop you know we, we're watching dogs um being put in the wrong situations or you know not not receiving quite the training that they needed at the right age or people getting given rescue dogs that are totally inappropriate and and that creates a lot of emotion for people who work in this field and so i think everybody at different levels has um a deeply emotional story when it comes to looking at something as big as this or it might just be that you know it was your neighbor that got bitten really badly or your child um it might be that you have been really horribly traumatized by dogs i think everybody has a really unique input into solving this problem and i just started off by reminding everybody that we are a community as in we have a common unity that's what that word means of dogs 
whether you love them, whether you don't like them, uh, we live with them. It used to be one in four households that had a dog. It's now one in three. You know, we can't get away from the fact that we are a nation of dog lovers. And, it, you know, I think many of us who do love dogs have been saddened that that's not the picture we're seeing right now. <laughs> you know, uh, we shouldn't be having dogs that are really seriously injuring people. So my heart for, for just starting us off really was, you know, I was bitten by a dog when I was a baby, I, I was um, 18 months old and I've still got this like scar on my nose. Um, and I was one of those babies that got bitten by a dog and, and then that dog um, was put to sleep because it bit a baby. And so I think, uh, you know, I know that in terms of dog behavior, that that dog didn't kill me because she chose not to kill me. <laughs> she could have done. <laughs> I'm very grateful that, you know, that I'm still here to tell the tale. I'm very aware that there are many people who haven't had that kind of grace and have had, you know, really serious injuries um, or even lost uh, people that they love. And so, you know, I know that with my skills and capacity that I can change big things. That's one of my skills. I can look at complicated things um, and strategize stages of change that might be able to change something that most people would be like, that's too big, that's impossible. Um, when I first came out of uni, I really wanted to, to do a TV show because there was a very famous dog trainer who was using techniques that I don't think are necessary. And I was like, okay, well, if he can do it that way, then surely we can just Darren Brown everybody back the other way. <laughs> TV, right? That's, that's, that's genius, it's easy. Yeah. And 10 years later, out of absolutely nowhere, um, a TV production company came to me and, you know, Channel 4 said, do you want to do you want to do a TV show about puppy training? And I was like, yeah. Um, and I, you know, I believe I have faith and I believe that God gave me those opportunities and that I'm I'm going to steward them the best way that I can in, in, in all of those arenas. So and then I've got books and I've got a book about dog body language and behavior. <laughs> That's yeah. what I'm going to teach people. But yeah. ultimately, and above all else, I think the key is to really approach listening to these stories and perspectives. As we get into the part two, some of this is going to get gnarly, you know, when we start talking about the breed debate and, you know, BSL and dangerous dog breeds and, you know, these discussions are going to get heated. And just what I really wanted to encourage everybody is that uh, we all have a perspective and if we can learn as a community to step into listening to other people's perspectives with love respecting them for who they are and not letting someone else's perspective affect the way that we respond i think we're going to be able to do some really cool stuff Brilliant. i think it's learning to say just my perspective is not my identity and there's yeah. lots of different voices out there so we need each other we need to keep talking to each other this is everybody and nobody's problem and that's why we all need to pitch in um, and love each other well as we listen yeah, and I think that's a, a brilliant message because, you know, ultimately, if we don't, if we're all kind of saying, oh, we need to be doing this, we need to be doing that, and every, every kind of different party and different groups, you know, promoting a different thing or saying we need to do it this way or we need to do it my way, then we're probably not going to get anywhere or we're certainly not going to get as far um, as we might get if we all really come together and, and, and work towards that. And the other thing I would say is Hannah hasn't mentioned that she also has a podcast. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so I definitely recommend anyone checking that out, particularly in terms of um, echoing that kind of and what Hannah's just mentioned there, the I believe the second and third episodes with um, Dr. Martin Cloud. Henry, very close. Henry Cloud. <laughs> um, apologies if Dr. Cloud listens to this. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm sure he's a very he sounds like a very, very, very forgiving man. So um, <laughs> <laughs> um, who. Um, give some really good tips in terms of how to actually deal with people and how to actually navigate those situations where someone might not share that same point of view as, as you because you may often find in those situations that although you have a differing view the the outcome you're looking for or you kind of your 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 beliefs m may still align um, I think hopefully that's a, a a very very kind of brief summary of kind of what he was sort of looking at for. <laughs> yeah, it, it was difficult conversations, and I think and we timed it so that actually both those episodes were out for the beginning of this um, 
conversation because I knew that it would get sticky <laughs> actually um and we all need to learn how to have difficult conversations well I think we if you think about the way that inventors work they sit around a problem and they they problem solve together but there's no judgment right they're like what if we change that bit and make that go up instead of down they go oh no that broke it okay what if we make it go left instead of right oh yeah. that was marginally better and they faff right that's what teams of inventors do and i think when it comes to something as big as this we all need to be able to go what if we tweak this this way what if we did this this way instead um because on a fundamental level at the at the, the way that we are right now with unregulated dog trainers with uh, little to no sort of follow-up like intermingling of of the police force and the council and the data from the hospitals doesn't exist there's there are no systems in place here for us to collect the data we need to understand this problem better and and then really spread information well so yeah we need to learn to love each other and listen to each other a little bit better and yeah so thank you that podcast is called the future of dogs should the future be- of dogs yes on spotify and and other platforms as well is it yeah yeah it should yeah. be if it isn't on one let me know and i'll and i'll yeah. find out and get yeah, it up. right in if, it, if it's not there <laughs> Um, so yeah, no. Something else then that that as, as you just mentioned that, that came up in the event was while we do know that there's this rise in dog bites and rise in um, injuries um, as a result of dog bites, what isn't known so much as is, is information on the circumstances of those bites. Um, so I mean, and, and that's really really key information in terms of ascertaining the cause on that because if we obviously we can ascertain the cause, then that's going to inform us better about how to resolve that. So I mean, what's your take on that? I mean, is there? Do you think there's things we can do to start getting more information on the cause? Do you think that then there's more work that needs to be done on that? Hugely, I think. I think from from the event, what did we take away from some of the speakers? Um, Carrie and John are amazing doctorate researchers who have literally invested their lives and i know many others james oxley is another one daniel mills incredible scientists who've really you know dug into the data um and have spent their lives and they and they are always looking for more funding i think the first thing they definitely cried out for um from having done all this research is number one we need more we need more funding to really look at this stuff um dr tulloch i know publish this research he wasn't paid to he just did it because he thought that it needed doing which is amazing um more scientists like that in the world please that's amazing um so number one we need more funding number two we definitely need better systems in place um but the government can't apportion the difficult thing with a problem like this is it's really easy to to catch on to one oh that'll sort of make it a little bit better we'll just throw some money at that we, we need to really look at the whole situation, the whole picture before we start investing in it, right? Which is why this event is a three-part event. We definitely need a data collection system. I think much like the knife crime uh, forms that police have to fill out and are, and are in hospitals, there's a really simple uh, data collection system there. But as I think John was saying, it's really difficult when it comes to dog bite data because we only get the data of serious hospitalizations and deaths and that's just the tip of the iceberg there's so many people who are seen by general practice by gps um so many that are just dealt with at home because there's a big shroud of sort of shame over oh my dog bit my kid i'm worried that my dog's going to get put down if anyone finds out or someone will take it off me um and really that's that's unlikely unless it was somebody else's, you know, if, if your dog has bitten your child and you and the dog and the child have had a chat about it and said, look, we'll forgive and forget, you know, no one's going to come around and, and seize your dog. Like that's really important. People know that. Um, but yeah, if, you, if your dog has bitten someone else's child and they say, hey, I, I think you need to manage that situation again, more often than not, you'll be encouraged to do some training, make sure the dog is wearing a muzzle. There's so many interventions before uh so so yeah we definitely need a data collection system for dog bites they need the data to be able to do the maths um and just i think a really key takeaway from that event also was that we can't jump to conclusions it's the reason that we're doing these three events is that it's easy to take as i say one thing and and try and create a a measure based on that one thing so 
you know, I can say, oh, well, I'm a dog behaviorist and I know that people don't know how to read dog body language. So I think we should invest a hundred thousand pounds in, uh, you know, a free campaign to give everybody dog body language education. I mean, I think that would be amazing, uh, but we can't jump to those conclusions until we've looked at all the facts. And so that was the point of the beginning of this. Many, many campaigns have been thrown out there like this is what we need to do to fix that problem. We don't really know the size of the problem. So, yeah. 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 And specifically when we're dealing with governments and funding is an issue um, because, you know, of course it is. And economically, we're, we're in a place where funding is especially an issue at the moment. Yeah. Um, those things have to be handled really, really carefully. And if you're going to be, um, you know, looking at trying to get funding for something you've got to be hopefully have kind of hope, at least some data that says this is going to work or, or this is going to make a difference um or this is going to be the best way to allocate this funding even i suppose make a difference in the most sort of efficient productive way mm-hmm. um so yes yeah, it's, it's a real real challenge isn't it and as you say oh, well, getting that- one of those stats i think that john dropped which was really fascinating was that you know what it's it's women who are getting bitten more um, dog bites have tripled in an age bracket of, I think it was 34 to 65 year old women. And uh, they're in specific areas of the UK as well, um, often rural areas. So people assume the dog bite picture is like, you know, some sort of bull breed that's, you know, uh, latched onto somebody in an inner city area, maybe in a park. And actually, John really showed us the data says, no, no, these are dogs who are biting people in rural homes, mostly women, um, and that uh, it's not necessarily the breeds that you would expect. The death data definitely has a breed uh, journey. And we're going to ask that in part two, we're really looking at, is it the dogs? Um, And we can dig into that a little bit more later. But yeah john was really showing us the data is not what we would assume it would be when it comes to dealing with this so actually if it is certain geographical areas is it better for us to apportion some resources in particular geographical places in the uk rather than a national drive um he would argue as a scientist that that would make more sense because actually that's where we're seeing the the biggest problems arising yeah and that's really interesting to think about it's just kind of really fine tuning those those interventions and i think with those those areas it's 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 trying to also pinpoint why why is that issue worse in a particular area i mean there were a few areas came up that came up i think one that came up that sort of jumped out at me that i wouldn't have expected is 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 oxfordshire Mm -hmm. um i believe do you remember that coming up as well um so again I think in, in Kent, where I live, so or, or where both of us live, yeah. we're actually lucky that we have slightly lower rates of dog bites, um, according to John's data. So mm. why is Kent looking like a very different picture to Oxfordshire? Because they're not that different. They're only, uh, you know, 30 minutes or, or for maybe, maybe an hour on the M25. Um, why is the picture so different in, in, in those different areas? Mm, it's such a good question. And, and only the researchers are going to be able to tell us that really. Um, yeah. and the data. Um, and there's, you know, I think he did say that th- there was very clearly a socioeconomic line here, that often it was happening in slightly more, um, slightly lower economically sound zones. Um, so it was connected in some ways to, to a level of poverty. Um, and that's really important. You know, people say a lot, there's, a, there's been a huge rise in security dog training and breeding. I think one of our speakers, uh, maybe a couple of our speakers in the next event are going to touch on uh, that in more depth. Um, but that just made me go, well, why? Why are we seeing more people breeding guard dogs? Uh, the simplest answer to that is that more people are frightened you might say. And then again, I'd go into my sociologist mind and go, well, why are people more frightened? And maybe that's something that we need to be looking at um, attacking and improving uh, as a statistic. It's like, should, you know, that's something we can all do. If your next door neighbor's terrified of you, feels the need to have a big scary dog, there's a couple of things you can do. You could be nice to your neighbor. 
<laughs> which sounds so simple doesn't it but actually i think it is something we all need to learn to do especially post covid when we've all been very like oh my gosh everybody stay away i could get a disease from anyone coughing or looking at me um and with movies like smile on buses going oh well, be careful if someone smiles at you there's a lot of fear about you know uh, and i do think we need to kind of look at that in more depth so yeah why why is it oxfordshire and why is it kent we're all going on this learning journey together. And the beautiful thing about an event series like this is not only do we get to, to speak to some of the best people in the country to give us this information, um, we get to decide together what we do with it. So we're going on this journey. This is not a destination. These events are a journey. And at the end of um, you know spring, summer in 2023, when we do our part three and come up with some legislative ideas, we're all pitching in to what this might look like to calling government to, to take action in ways that we've all pitched into you know yeah. um so yeah it's a really exciting journey that we're going on and i think big things are going to happen i mean personally at the end of my talk there were a couple of things that i would love to see um happen straight away uh, for me I, I mean i would love to see dog trainers and behaviorists regulated very grateful to say that DEFRA allowed us to speak for them in that event um, and DEFRA, the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, so those are the people in government that deal with farming and food and dogs. Um, they gave us a statement and they allowed us to speak for them and explain that they are doing a lot already. They have created a responsible dog ownership steering group and that's got lots of different stakeholders in it and they meet regularly and in January they are going to give government some of their suggestions about what improving our nation's responsible dog ownership capacity might look like so we're really looking forward to seeing what happens in January and one of their measures is to regulate the dog training and behavior field has to be done really needs doing I would love to see um yeah actually the UK just lament and maybe take a day or just do a minute's silence on a particular day for the lives that we have lost. I think it's tragic on a number of levels because really, <sighs> I feel like that's everybody's responsibility, you know? Um, and on the day I, I told a story, it's a true story, about a mayor who was the mayor of New York in a time when the mayor could do, he had a more flexible role. And one day he sat in on a court case um, for a lady, a grandma who had um, stolen some bread to feed her grandchildren. And the mayor sat in as the judge and he listened to the case and he said, yeah, that's, that's right. You broke the law. And the baker was saying, she owes me money because she stole bread from me. And the mayor said, yeah, you're right. She's guilty of theft. And he took his wallet out of his pocket and he took some money out of it and he walked over to the baker and he put that down and he said her debt for that bread is paid her fine is paid and now i want 50 cents from every single person sitting in this courtroom and he collected the 50 cents from everybody and he gave it to the grandma and he said that is everybody's penance for living in a community that would see a grandma have to steal to feed her grandchild you know and i think that applies to all of us we have to really take a minute and go, oh, do I want to live in a world where people could get horribly attacked by dogs? Um, no, <laughs> no, I don't want to live in that community. And I think we've all got a part to play in loving each other a bit more, being slightly more responsible for our own dog's behavior, getting the education that we need to make sure that our dogs are safe um and being more compassionate towards each other when these situations arise so yeah i'd love to see that and the last thing i'd love to see um is that we have an amazing chap called jim crosby and he is a veterinary forensics expert and he's offered to look into our cases uh, pro bono so for free um and so we were calling out for all of the uk police forces that have had these tragedies occur to um to give their case files over to jim in the us and he's happy to come to uk parliament and present for us 
on the findings once he once he studies some of these um, case files. And then he's going to compare some of them with the US and we can get a, a little bit more of a transatlantic picture on this data and what we're what we're really seeing in the world of uh, dog tragic deaths. So, yeah. yeah, and that's, I mean, absolutely fascinating, isn't it? Trying to get a picture from all those different sources as well whether it's the police force whether it's the individuals experiencing the bites whether it's the hospitals that are are, are um dealing with the outcomes of yeah. dog bites um and or, or whether it's you know obviously very sadly the families of people that have um lost a family member to, for, mm. to a fatal dog bite as well yeah. Yeah. and that's something that that did come up um in 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 john's talk as well that there was or there has been a significant rise in in dog bite fatalities in 2022 yeah but it's really hard at the moment to really know what to make of that because Mm. it's 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 we're dealing with small numbers fortunately so that's that's good but it means that actually interpreting those numbers can be quite tricky to know whether that rise has been is a very very unfortunate sort of coincidence Mm. or whether it's the part of a potentially changing um trend yes this is it and i think it it could be a blip i really hope it is statistically that 2022 is just a freak year and many people said, well, is it because of lockdown, actually? Is it because we've just got loads more dogs? And one of the statistics John shared was that actually, no, dog bites are increasing quicker than the population of dogs is increasing. So we can say quite confidently it's not because of lockdown. Um, it might be, from our perspective as behaviourists, actually, that it could be getting a bit worse because we know definitely that puppies who didn't get quite the socialisation that we would have loved them to have had uh, through no fault of their own or their own own fault um, during lockdown obviously those puppies are going to be now out in the community a little bit more nervous and need extra support um, but yeah it was really strange that 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 was that was what we found through John's data is that it's not the people that you think are getting bitten um, and we don't know we don't know if it is a blip statistically the deaths have been about average two to three people um, and so this nine in one year was a lot. That is a huge, uh, yeah. And that's a year that's unfortunately not not even finished. So, um, yeah. and that was November at the time. So I don't I don't believe there's been any more no. since no. since we spoke um, to John. As far as I know, is do you know anything different on that? I don't think so. I tend to get sent them straight away. Sadly, yeah. now. Yeah, um, <laughs> so do I. So, yeah. So, and just, yeah, my heart goes out to anybody who knows the people who did pass. And I just, yeah, yeah, our condolences to you. It's, um, we would love you to be involved actually in changing this narrative um, and just encourage you to come, um, come to the meetings. Everybody can come to the meetings, by the way. They're not like secrets. Uh, they're in parliament, so you have to get to London, but you can you can sign up for tickets to all of these events you can be there in person we have limited seats so once they go they go um but everybody can come and this is a really unique space where we can get humans (laughs) the people of the uk together with policymakers uh the press um amazing scientists incredible you know change makers who have the capacity and the network to really to really shift this but most importantly i would say the grassroots there was such a lovely group of human beings in that room from all walks of life from dog owners uh, to what we would call in the industry dog enthusiasts people who love dogs and study dogs but maybe don't don't do anything with them professionally um right up to you know uh, the kennel club were there dogs trust were there many rescue organizations were, were represented in that room and uh kendall shepherd the wonder that is um was there you know people who've studied and dealt with you know, been expert witness for dangerous dog cases for decades. um, And I've really got two feet in that, uh, in that fight, as it as it were. And so there was such a wonderful vibe, even though the stuff that we were looking at together was hard to swallow, difficult. Um, Andrea Jester gave us a beautiful summation of some of the human stories and had a couple of videos 
Um, they obviously can't be can't be published publicly because they are not for public consumption. But different people's stories about how dog bites have affected their lives and um, yeah, it was really encouraging. Weirdly, by the end of the meeting, all of these people there was such a sense of hope and unified responsibility um, about what might happen in the future. Yeah, yeah, no, it was a a, a really um, I think a, a positive atmosphere and. Um, a sense of hopefully yeah as you say people coming together and hopefully really looking at what can be done in terms of making making change um you were there so think, Dan. what did yes. you think what, what I was mean, it like i, I loved it i i i thought it was i mean it for me it was fascinating um to actually get those insights from people as i say from all over so from not just the dog industry but also from um from the 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 human medical industry dealing with dog bites but then also even at the end we had a q a so that was really really interesting and we got people that worked in the insurance industry asking yeah. questions so people from um i can't remember the specific insurance companies but certainly ones you'd recognize if anyone has a pet and has them insured so um, i don't want to give you the wrong <laughs> insurance company but um <laughs> yeah the people from major in pet insurance companies there and they were they obviously have a big stake in this because they have to pay out because of dog bites but that does mean on the other hand that they they have lots of things like data around around dog bites and and, and what might have happened um in those situations so they could be a really valuable tool um to use um in that as well the uh, we have another person there that was from the legal industry and the legal profession um so i mean that obviously is a, a, a an incredible job to be in in the sense that you're dealing with cases of dog bite and dog dog kind of law um and and how this kind of reflects on that um so we've got a bit of a little bit of an insight on that as well so i mean yeah it was a fantastic event and and, and i think the good thing is really that kind of that amalgamation of so so many so many different industries which i think was brilliant Mm -hmm. um i mean i think what would be good actually if is is perhaps for those of those that don't know kind of about the process of all of this and firstly don't know how kind of the process of um the very complicated case of taking things to parliament and dealing with all, all that works but also don't know about specifically how this sort of the the dog bite um events are going to work yeah. could you tell us a little bit about kind of what these part one part two part three are about how that's all going to work and, and and practically what are the implications of this so how if this goes well how could this start making changes that are tangible that people can really see in terms of dog bites mm, really good question okay so the first thing I'm going to say before I say anything else is that if you really want to understand parliamentary process in depth, Mark Abraham, who is the secretariat and co-chair, co-founder of AppDog, the all-party parliamentary dog advisory welfare group, boom, um, and, and Mark works with Rosie Duffield, Duffield MP, who is the MP of Canterbury, uh, and Mark has written a book called Be More Mosquito, specifically about how to change laws and how to how to understand uh, how any grassroots campaigner whatever your area of 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 heart song is whatever it is that you want to change in the world it doesn't need to be dog related uh he has the tools in that book to help you to learn to do that so i definitely point you there first um but in terms of the way that this process works and what i've learned so far um this is a three-part event, which is rare for an all-party parliamentary group. APPGs don't normally do a series, um, but it's such a huge area and it touches on so many other areas. You know, AppDog have done meetings on Romanian rescue and overseas rescue. They've done meetings on dangerous dogs. They've done meetings on, you know, greyhound racing. There are some amazing campaigners, but this one really pulls in lots of different meetings. There's been a meeting on whether dog trainers and behaviors should be regulated. And each time we do that, each time AppDog creates a, an area to have a conversation, what that does is it stimulates conversation in Parliament. So the heart of this process is that we can come up with um, some suggestions that would go to a select committee and that's the process. So the select committee would sit down and that is um, a group of MPs that are within department. I believe that this is a cross departmental issue. Personally, I think this 
is not just DEFRA. I think this is a Department of Education and a Department of Health remit. So it's quite a large event series for that reason. It touches on lots of different uh, places. So part one, we looked at the facts. What do we know? Because until we know what we know and what we don't know and leave a lot of room for what we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> and I'm yeah. sure that will come in time. Once we've got that, we can start to process some of the things that already start needing change, like forms for dog bites in hospitals. Stage two, so part two, uh, we're going to look at the question, is it the dogs? And we're really going to dig in to dog breeding, dog training, um, dog rescue. Uh, we're going to ask the highly emotive question of, are, you know, are we actually living in a generation where the dogs are more aggressive than they used to be? Um, is that true? And if that is true, then why? Why are we living in that? Is it that we're breeding more aggressive dogs? Are we training dogs to be more aggressive? Are we, you know, I think everyone's going to be the environment that dogs are in, because obviously we've built up since, you know, where we were 30 years ago as well as the other one that would come to mind. Yeah, loads of screens. The dogs mm. are just like, hello, stop <laughs> looking at your computer. She says doing a Facebook Live. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's super hard. So yeah, we're going to look at that. What is it the dogs? It could be. And then part three, we're going to look at a combination of um, human legislation. And we're really going to bring to the fore some of the um, organisations that are, are making a difference already or that might be the future so we're going to start to look at you know what can we change we're going to talk to um people who work in law and uh in this particular area and yeah we're going to start to come up with some suggestions together um that part three yeah will be in late spring early summer and at the end of that we'll have this wonderful packet of measures and all of the conversation that i know is going to happen just from this facebook live isn't that exciting? We can all be part of this narrative. I would just encourage all of you right now that are like, I have an opinion and it's really important to just give it with love, right? One of the things that we believe in AppDog is that it's all about solutions. If you come with a problem without a solution and just wanna shout about the problem, it's a really difficult thing. And your opinion is so welcome. But actually, it's difficult, difficult for us to process without a solution. So let's all step into this conversation solutions focused. And remember that we're on the same side of the table as Dr. Henry Cloud would put it. And the problem is on the other side of the table. And the problem I do not think at the end of this um, series of events, we're not going to find that this problem is one person, one organization, one breed, one, you know, law. I don't think it's going to be one thing that is broken here. I think this is pockets of brokenness that have all come into this, as I say, trauma trifle. And we need to take it apart um, and go easy with each other on fixing these things because none of us want to live this way. You know? Yeah, and it's easy to kind of feel defensive, isn't it? If you're saying, oh, it's, you know, it's your fault or you're the breeders, you've been making these dogs that are biting more people or, you know, it's your fault, you're the trainers or the behaviourists, you've been taking the wrong approaches. So it's easy to, it's, it's so easy to get into that kind of defensive way of thinking mm -hmm. um, and potentially that accusatory way of thinking as well. So I think, you know, like you say, trying to really veer away from that and really work towards just like your like your example with kind of the event inventors earlier just just what's gonna work in terms of solution doesn't matter who's been doing what and and, and what's been happening and mm. you know it's not anyone's fault nobody here has deliberately <laughs> really other than obviously i know there are a few exceptions but nobody has deliberately trying to get more people bit and more people injured yeah. um from dog bites right. um we all everyone there certainly everyone at Abdog <laughs> wants to reduce um dog bites yeah so it's just a case of really uh, working together on that isn't it absolutely and you know it's understanding that it's a highly emotive topic mm. um and being gentle with yourself <laughs> if you're about to write a comment on facebook it might be worth going oh where is this coming from is this the best place to put this um 
<laughs> because you know what as i say we all need loads of grace don't we we need grace uh one of the things that i think i said in my in my speech is that we're, we're all really quick to point the finger when someone messes up we all do it don't we when someone cuts us up on a road or like takes the right hand lane and then pulls back into traffic and we're like everybody is quick to point the finger but when it's you and you're like oh I genuinely didn't know that this wasn't a lane that I could go down and you're like sorry sorry we all need that grace don't we and as you say Daniel I don't think anybody is there's a small quotient perhaps of vicious and horrible people who are trying to make the world a less fun place to live in um but I think on the on, on the whole the majority of the human race they're good people you yeah. can massively disagree with me at this point. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, think, I'm a fearless yeah. optimist in this, and I believe that human beings are inherently good, um, but need grace. We all need grace. You know, I don't want to hit somebody in the face with the plank that's in my eye um, and be like, you've got a speck in yours. Like, that's not the way I want to live. None of us need to live that way. So, yeah, let's just have a bit of grace for it. My goodness yeah. me. I'm not holding my mum and being like, you got me bitten in the face when I was a child. You know what? Sometimes these things do happen um, and they're unfortunate and it is really hard. Speaking of which, I'd just like to read out a couple of um, myths that Carrie Westgarth dropped. I loved Carrie's uh, talk. I loved them all, but I really found Carrie's was quite striking. Um, I'm going to get it up, actually, Daniel, in the background. Yeah, so I can read through some of these points. But what did what, what did you take from, from Carrie's um talk Daniel what was the biggest takeaway for you on that one I mean so yes yeah, so Carrie did a brilliant talk um and um in that she looked at um various different myths that came up in terms of in, in terms of what might stop dog bites right so so we've all got our beliefs about what what might reduce the dog bite problem right and we've all got our beliefs about dog bites in general and what Carrie's talk, I think, did was it, it really gave everyone an opportunity to actually examine some of those beliefs and say, actually, you, is that founded? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, so she, she just kind of dug into kind of what some some I don't I can't quite remember exactly how many she did, but <laughs> there were quite a few, um, yeah. quite a few kind of myths surrounding dogs and dog bites and and, and also some truths, um, but primarily kind of focused on some of the myths and and, and false beliefs people may have around um, dog bites. So I mean, mm. and then and then she actually finished that off with as well, and. Um, looking at interventions that will really make a difference on this so i mean a few of the things that she popped that that popped up on hers were um education being one thing but certainly not being the only thing that's yeah. going to make a difference on this so education alone not necessarily being enough um to to, to tackle the dog bite problem because edu you know education can be brilliant it can help people understand their dog's body language better but it's not on its own necessarily going to be enough um yeah. a few other things that she brought up was um looking at dog breeding um and how dogs are bred and how that could influence things things like even down to muzzle training um of dogs to to better support and better protect uh yeah. against these issues um and also environmental changes so um I mean, my background is psychology so i really like things like kind of nudging people's behavior so nudges are kind of those small things that we um can do uh that we kind of do and 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 make people aware of that might change their behavior right mm -hmm. so i mean one thing that we came across in the covid pandemic to use as a really good example is um not shaking hands um, now, actually, not shaking hands in itself doesn't massively reduce your in, chances of getting infected. And because most people uh, will, will wash their hands and, and, and do their, the things before eating or touching their face and things like that. So actually, shaking hands doesn't massively reduce your chance of getting infected, but it does make you more aware of what you're doing with your hands. So it increases your chances of washing your hands and not touching your face and doing things like that. So it's a really cool example of a behavioral nudge. So anyway, mm -hmm. Carrie um, looked at a few few um, things like this that 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 might start changing social norms around dogs. So so whether it's okay, for example, to leave a kid and a dog alone together or a child and a dog alone together, is that okay? Because currently the social norm around that of um, I think some people 
many people will consider that an acceptable thing to do might not actually reflect what needs to be done to be, be safe because yeah you, realistically yeah most dogs probably can be left alone with kids and it will be perfectly fine but if there's still if there's that one case where it goes wrong and that leads to something as bad as a fatality mm. then we have to question whether that is a good a good thing to do yeah. um also environmental changes popped up as well so things like even down to to the gates you have on your house or the gates yeah. you have in your house dog gates yeah. in the house dog gates um uh, uh, gates on your kind of front front area i mean so 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 many things so i mean tell tell me a little bit more about what what you've got up on on that yeah sure yeah i mean i, I found hers to be particularly shocking in that some of the things that she said i was like please carry don't let that be true but we have to trust you know she's a she's a scientist who's been studying this for years and so myth number one um was that it's just one of those things um but actually that's not true uh you know ultimately it's not just one of those things. There's lots of stuff that we can do to change our environment. And actually, as you say, barriers to injury prevention um, are really are really helpful. You know, Carrie does a lot of work with the uh, post post people, uh, Royal Mail, to stop post people getting bitten, as you say, and interventions as simple as a, a box to collect your post, because obviously your dog's gonna be like, who's this guy trying to break into my house? And um, there's just so much we can be doing to, to make it less likely that dogs will bite people. Maybe it's a standard practice that when the doorbell goes, you put your dog in another room behind a door if you're at home before you open the door. Little things like that are gonna make a huge difference. Myth number two was that there are no bad dogs. Um, there are just bad owners. And again, her book, uh, really is important to to read here the dog bite book um there are there's 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 lots to look at there's so much data there um and yeah there's a lot of a lot of data about owners um and parents of dogs and behavior problems there um yes so actually is it the dogs sometimes maybe is it the owners sometimes maybe so generic uh, statements like this are really unhelpful um to the data i also want to believe there are no bad owners um but sometimes you know people don't put the time in and they don't pick a good dog um, and we know as trainers sometimes you know not every puppy is equal to just get a puppy home and be like it's new so it's probably fine not necessarily true um there's a lot of difference between some puppies and others genetically speaking um another myth was that uh, the the dangerous breeds and actually she showed us some statistics of so the top breeds top top breeds that have been buying children uh, this is from older hay hospital and this was in 2001 um actually the top dog that was biting children in this particular hospital obviously she's looking at the north uh was the french bulldog followed by the shih tzu followed by the Jack Russell, then the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and then the German Shepherd. So French Bulldogs, guys, um, were a much higher likelihood of, of biting somebody than, you know, bull breeds, although they're still in there. So you know what? We don't know. We think we know, but we don't know um, what the specific breeds are. Uh, myth number four is again this was a really difficult one and we're going to go into this again in more depth in, in number two but carrie was like uh the myth of deed not breed actually when we look at the dogs the breeds of dogs that were involved in human fatalities since the introduction of the dda in 1991 to 2022 uh, 11 of those were pit bulls so actually it's really difficult the, the data does still suggest and swing towards this particular breed of dog and so we can't ignore that that's really important um second was a crossbreed third was a Staffordshire Bull Terrier fourth was an American Bulldog and then a German Shepherd and we're looking at numbers from 11 10 10 7 and 5 so mm, difficult actually uh, that breed of dog is statistically creating more havoc than others um Ah, oh, and none of us want to hear this, right? <laughs> um, myth number five is that there's just irresponsible owners. And this is difficult because we kind of always delegate the responsibility to other people when things kind of go wrong. Um, and responsible dog ownership is varied. Uh, they're doing what's best for their dog. Um, myth number six was the victim did something. Actually, that's not necessarily true. There's lots and lots of people who... Um, 
who got bitten that did absolutely nothing. They were just sitting minding their own business um, and got bitten by a dog or got bitten in a park. Um, and they, they really weren't doing anything. <laughs> so there's lots of evidence and we tend to be like, oh, what did you do? You know, you must have you must have messed with the dog. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of data to suggest that actually that's not fair. Um, yeah, sometimes yeah. the dog is stressed, stressed or frustrated. Number six was that the victim did do something. Okay, this is more data on the victim doing something. There's huge amounts here. Some people were just sitting and chilling. I wasn't even aware that there was a dog and a woman next to me. Didn't know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, just... isn't it? And it, it, I think it also brings me back to that question of mm. what are the individual causes of these dog bites? Yeah. What what are those factors that are, that are contributing to that? Because again, that's that's what we don't know. So I think that's just one of the big questions. And hopefully something I hope comes out of this is whether it's allocating funding for more research or, or, or getting hopefully the right groups together to allow us to get some more information on what is causing these dog bites. Yeah. Um, just getting those barriers out of the way to people wanting mm. to talk about it as well. And just and yeah. actually saying, oh, because one of them was like, my dog and child were both playing with a bubble machine and they went for the same bubble. That's not a dog attack, but it's still written down in the data as a dog bite because the dog bit the child. And they were both going for the same bubble. It happens, you know? Yeah. Um, myth number seven was that it wouldn't happen to me. Myth number eight, this was the hardest for me, was that education is the answer. And actually, it's not always necessarily. Um, Carrie said that the most successful interventions are passive changes, as you say, changing the environment. They're much more helpful um, than massive education drives, which makes me go, I just want to, I want you all still to understand dog behaviour. For me, I think understanding um posture and pose is also really helpful because that is that can be preventative if your dog is over aroused and you think they're just having a really good day um that is a preventative measure you can go actually my dog is not comfortable so yeah yeah if you've got that kind of split second advantage as well if you're a, a person that may just have a have more of an inkling that that dog isn't isn't too happy about a particular situation i mean mm. it, 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 yeah certainly might make a difference but yeah it's 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 interesting isn't it to read that education it's it's not it's certainly not the it's you know it's not the big answer for these yeah. things and that's that's not not what i would have expected either for sure and that's what i love about this event actually series is that we're really getting to see such a broad range of perspectives such a broad range of experience levels um and again everyone can do their part to improve to improve the world in their particular area uh, you know you and i daniel both work one-to-one -one with dogs we also educate and and provide talks and seminars for professionals to improve their brains um you know all about the brain because you're the super brain <laughs> on the brain um and i, I love your work there and uh, and equally guys i've done what i can do so for the next month if you go to amplifiedbehavior.com i have a course that's a three chapter um, video course on dog body language so whether you have a dog or are a dog trainer or a dog walker or a vet um or you live next door to a dog you can get what was 149 pounds worth of education for just 21 pounds until the end of december so jump on that because it will go back up um but it's what i can do uh between now and the future to be able to give people access to reading their dogs well although it's not the only answer mm -hmm. you know education is one of a number of things we can do so and for anyone that is interested in that i have just just about to put the link to that in the comments so everyone can just go and find that nice nice. and easily if they want to as well nice <gasps> so exciting so, so yeah. <laughs> i think that gives us a good a good place to kind of wrap this up um i think it's been great talking to you um and just it's been really useful for me and hopefully everyone that's listening to to just have a bit of time just to kind of reflect on some of those topics that that were discussed and brought up and 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 just kind of even bounce some ideas around about kind of what what might come up, what we might be looking at in the future, how the future may look for dogs and legislation around dogs and kind of the world of dogs, really. Um, or certainly, certainly at the very least, the world of dogs in the UK. Um, but I mean, hopefully 
that's the good thing about if we if, if we start seeing some of these some really great changes then we could have models that are adopted even by other countries so you never know um <laughs> But um, all for that, let's go. You know, we say we're man's best friends. Let's prove it. Yeah, yeah, They're absolutely. Man's then, <laughs> we're man's best friend. <laughs> let's give dogs back the title of man's best friend, and oh. let's prove that we're theirs. I think it's time. Yeah, you know? yeah and it's, it's supporting them as well because I think, you know, if we've if we've bred dogs and put dogs in environments that they're just not built for, yeah. then it just feels so mean being like, hey, you can't do that. Um, when a dog turns around and does something that it's been bred for um it's, or yeah. saying i need help i need yeah. i don't know how to meet my own needs i've got a need that's been unmet and this is how i'm expressing myself yeah. um it's really hard we're like shut up sit down stop it and they're like it's not okay yeah. is it yeah so i mean it's yes it's, it's, i think that's the thing it's not just about helping humans it's helping dogs as well because dogs don't want to be biting people majority of the time do they um, um, they don't the enjoy it joking, so yeah. they people, but they love buying stuff and just, there's nothing yeah like what they're bred for you know? um, <laughs> yeah um but yeah um yeah so yeah lot so much to think about it's been great talking to you um where can people find out more about what's happening next and and, mm -hmm. and, and what's going on next with this Mm -hmm. so um keep your eyes peeled if you go to www.appdog.co.uk i believe let me triple check that right now um it might even be an org so appdog has a website and that's where you would find out about all it's .co.uk www.appdawg.co.uk and you can sign up to their mailing list so you can find out about all of the events that happen on a monthly basis they meet every month uh, to talk about lots of different things i think tomorrow's event is uh, the unsung heroes and you can still go along to that right now um and yeah that's the first place to go. They're going to hit you with all of the most amazing news. Uh, you can also follow uh, myself um, as Hannah Malloy on Facebook and Amplified Behaviour. I'm going to be uh, dropping some news as it comes there. Also, Debbie Luckin, who runs Kids Around Dogs, has been helping me um, to, to run these events. She's just been amazing. Uh, Debbie's been all over it. And some of you will be talking to her via email when you apply for your next ticket uh, to the February event. Please don't ask me for a ticket yet um, because we haven't booked the room. So I can't give you a ticket until we've got that room booked. But that's coming very soon. So, yeah, definitely app dog. Uh, keep in touch with us there um, and I'm sure Daniel you'll get uh, some of some of that news coming through um, and also via Jordan Shelley on Facebook as well uh, yeah we'll all be talking about it it's huge brilliant so lots of channels there hopefully to kind of keep updated and keep in the loop on things which is brilliant okay well lovely to speak to you have a lovely rest of your evening and hopefully we'll talk soon and perhaps another update even after the next um, event so we can we can kind of keep this going a little bit. Happy to talk to you guys about it. I will say, though, if you want to have your voice really, truly heard, please come. OK, this is no substitute for being in the event. Get in the room where it happens. Get your voice heard. Get your perspective shared, because that is going to make all the difference as the events roll on. So thank yeah. you so much for having us. No, I mean, definitely come along. Yeah, brilliant. OK, well, great to speak to you. And um, thank you, everyone, for coming along and listening to this Facebook Live as well. Bless you guys. Thanks. Bye. Yeah.